Ishwaram's resplendent sun. It's the start of a bright new day. Time to rise, time to shine, Lord divine. Time to lead us along life's way. party awake O oh Lord over all mankind awake O oh Lord of compassion that the world good fortune Dear Swami, such as I, who is omnipresent and always with us, and is our strength and our power, and never lets us down. Uh, dear Swami, I pray that you speak through me and love through me and bring your presence to us all so we can benefit. And uh, Sai brothers and sisters, uh, how wonderful to be here. Uh, to be uh, in Swami's presence, because when uh, Sai devotees meet and uh, develop uh, Prashanti Niliyam in a gymnasium, that's a marvelous thing for the heart. And uh, I know what goes into uh, making an altar like this. Uh, <laughs> from scratch, you've uh, constructed something extraordinary. It's uh, uh, when somebody comes in and looks at this, you know that there's been love, lots of love. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. and uh, Mrs. Uh, Ja, for having my wife and I and uh, Faith Penn as your guests, and for the uh, entire group here for inviting us. It's uh, wonderful to be here. But I must admit, whenever I'm asked to give a talk on Swami, uh, I don't have a lot of courage. Uh, Swami says have courage, and uh, I, I haven't learned basics. Because uh, if you ask to say something about Swami, you have to say, what do I know about Swami? What do we know about Swami? Uh, he is so extraordinary. He is so vast. He is so magnificent. He is so deceptive. He looks like a child. And he's created the entire universe. He looks like he's separate from us, yet uh, he says that that's who we are. We're Swami. What do we know about Swami if we don't recognize that we're Swami? Uh, so right off the bat, uh, I'm asked to say something about Swami, and I understand that uh, I'm totally inadequate for that. I say then, do I know anything about life? And uh, the more I learn about Swami, and I'm with Swami, the more I learn that what I knew about life uh, seems insignificant. I think that um, you're different than me, and one religion is different than another religion, and that I'm... Uh, this body and this mind, and that I'm uh, limited to this uh, birth and this death. And uh, Swami says, foolish. <laughs> so, what does it uh, mean for me to stand up here and talk about Swami or about life? Uh, because I am like a babe in the woods. Every morning when I get up, I go through a certain meditation where I uh, watch the world, all events in the world that pass. You can't hold on to it. Just the last second when I talked about uh, Swami being so great beyond us, it's past. Where did it go? 
And uh, then the next thought comes. And the next movement. And then we uh, go to lunch, and then we go to dinner, and the next day comes. And uh, every event in time goes. What do we learn from that? Basic, basic experience. Where do we learn from that? And then we realize that every thought comes and goes. We have a marvelous concept. We think we understand life, and the next minute it's shattered. We uh, build up our courage, and we think that we understand how to run our family or our business. And we are charged up against life thinking that we've got the answer and we've conquered it. And then we get cancer and we die. What do we know about it? Uh, everything comes and goes. All our power, we strut around so powerfully with such great thoughts, and uh, in the next second it goes. And uh, all sense interest, all sense attraction, all sense objects, all desire, all concepts, all wanting, all wishing, all demanding, it comes and it goes, it comes and it goes. So what, is, what do we learn from that? Well, Swami says, detach from it. That's what you learn from it. It's impermanent. Don't hold on to it. But what if we don't hold on to it? Then our name, our form, all names, all forms, all uh, power, all fortune, all fame, family, friends, do they all go? Everything goes. Where are we in 100 years, in 200 years, in 500 years? Where are we in this uh, immense cosmos? What do we understand about it? Everything goes. So what do we do? If everything goes, what do we do about it? We understand that's basic, fundamental to our experience. What do we do with it? Everything comes and goes. Don't hold on to it, says Swami. But Swami, if I give it up, I feel so lost. Who am I? What am I? Who am I? What am I? Evidently, we have to ask that question very deeply. Who am I? Give it up. All power. Here I am, 56 years old. <laughs> I still can move my arms and legs, thank God. But in a couple of years, I won't be able to. I'll be on a bed. You know, if I have 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it's just a matter of time. The, uh, the body goes. The power goes. The prestige goes. You uh, earn a name because you've learned how to put together an equation or you know how to make a molecule in a test tube or you've said something nice or something. You've made a name. But where does it go? Where do you take it? All power, all prestige, all position. And we strut around thinking that we're so powerful. And in an instant, we're nothing. All uh, possessions, all people, we come and we go, we come and we go. How many people have been before us and will go after us? And yet, uh, we don't seem to grasp that. And we think that we can figure it out in this world. But it all comes and goes. It means nothing. Well, if we feel that, if we sense it, uh, for me, it leaves me like a little child uh, crying out in a dark night. Who am I? What is this all about? Uh, my body goes. My mind goes. Everything goes. Life goes, death goes. Life goes, death goes. That's my experience. Before meeting Swami, I uh, was just in torment over it because that's all I could see. Uh, I mean, I was successful. I was happy in the worldly life, but I could see this. And it was uh, sad. I thought I could find an answer in psychiatry. And after nine years, I recognized, no, they tell you how to... Uh, feel a little better from depression and anxiety and uh, deal better with people, but to the answer of what does it mean to be in this life? What does it mean to be in this, this existence? Why am I here? Why am I, when I'm shed of all the uh, uh, maya, uh, life, death, life, death, power, prestige, everything goes, and I'm like a little baby crying out, who's going to give me an answer? Thank God Swami has come in the Kali Yuga at such a dark age. Thank God he's come. Thank God Swami has come. He gives us some direction. Or we just hypnotize ourselves and anesthetize ourselves and go around thinking that uh, we should, the, the most uh, important thing is to choose whether we should have corn flakes or uh, graham flakes or toast uh, in the morning. That's what life should be. What kind of, uh, where do you place your mind in something like that? Why? Uh, although I prefer uh, a bagel. <laughs> But um, thank God, out of the dark. I remember uh, after nine years in psychiatry, I began to ask, have you ever seen a miracle? Why I kept, I, that came just out of my mind. Had you ever seen a miracle? Why? Because I had heard so many people talk. 
I had heard such great lecturers. You know, it's not that hard to talk and be convincing and influence people. I particularly cannot do it. <laughs> I've been asked to talk, but I don't feel comfortable doing it. But there are some people that can do it, and they are heroes on the stage, says Swami, and zeros in their life. Zeros in their life. And I, I've seen so many of those people. They get up, and they come and talk. They're marvelous, and uh, you take a look at their life, and you say, my God, they sound wonderful, and they hypnotize you, and you listen. So, um, Swami comes. And I said, um, have you ever seen a miracle? Well, why have you ever seen a miracle? Because talk is cheap, and I wanted to have an experience. And I also didn't trust subtle experience. I saw that person, and I knew he was God, and I fell down. I, I, don't, I didn't trust that as a scientist. I said, have you ever seen a miracle? Somebody said, I know a great uh, martial arts master. He just goes like this, and everybody's arm in the place twists. I said, uh, that doesn't seem too much too important to me, uh, that he can go like this, and from a distance, everybody's arm twists, and they fall to the ground. Have you ever seen a miracle? But for some reason, I heard of the miracles of Swami. I don't know. Uh, for me, it's just obvious. If he stands in front of a person and changes into Krishna, it's a very major thing. It's a major thing. Yet, uh, it's surprising how few people think that that has any significance whatsoever. That Swami can stand in front of somebody and turn into Shiva. I've talked to two people who have had personal experiences. Uh, Jack Hislop saw Swami turn into Krishna. Blue, beauty beyond uh, imagination. And I, of course, I think Swami's beauty beyond imagination. Um, and uh, Professor Kasturi was once talking to me and told me how, I said, why do you, uh, you know, Kasturi has this big, uh, had this big uh, swash of uh, ash on his forehead. And I said, why do you uh, see Swami as uh, Shiva? He said, well, one day I was talking to Swami about some aspect of Shiva. And uh, Swami said, Kasturi, look at me. And he said, I looked up at uh, Swami, and uh, he melted away, and in his place was Shiva and Shakti sitting on Nandi the bull. I said, Kasturi, really? He said, really? <laughs> For us, it means something. You'd think it means something to everybody, but it doesn't. I, I don't understand why it doesn't. That uh, people have seen uh, Swami raise the dead and turn into gods and goddesses, and it doesn't mean anything to them. For me, my heart just uh, opened up. Oh my God, there's somebody like that here. So uh, we approached Swami. And um, like a child uh, trembling in the night, crying out, uh, why am I on earth? What is this mystery? Why am I walking? What's the purpose? Uh, one day I was in an uh, interview with Swami, and a very unusual Swami uh, turned to me and said, you'll, you'll do the interpreting. <laughs> I'll do the interpreting. Um, because, uh, you know, uh, people generally have to know Telugu, uh, and it's good to know uh, English. And when I'm in Swami's presence now, my mind is very much like mush. I don't think very well. And, um, uh, and I don't know Telugu. So this is the only time Swami has ever done that. At least I knew that I should listen uh, if he tells me to do something like that. Somebody came to the door and says, would you want so-and-so to come and interpret to a group? Uh, and one friend of mine, who was a professor of pediatrics at uh, a university in Copenhagen. He was a head of the pediatric department. And um, Swami said, Sandweiss will interpret. <laughs> that was really, it's really funny. <laughs> so uh, Swami gave a marvelous discourse about the mind and about spirituality. And the end of the gist of it was that uh, all of us, or most of us, identify ourselves with our mind and our body. And that's not who we are. And Swami said, see, I've come to teach you this. I am every place at all times. I am in the most distant star, and I'm in the, uh, the closest blade of grass. I fill all of space as light. I live in everybody's heart. I'm everywhere at all times. I can transmute earth into sky and sky into earth, but I don't do it very frequently because it's inconvenient to some people. He said that. <laughs> but I can do it. Um... The difference between you and I, as uh, uh, Mr. Cha said, I know that I'm this. I am every place at all times. I am every form and every name. I always was and always will be. I never was not. 
I am creator, destroyer, and preserver. I am every place at all times, everlasting light, infinite bliss. I am complete, limitless love. I am constant, integrated awareness. I am the totality. My God! And that's who you are. Well, for a little child uh, shaking in the night and looking up in the sky, in the dark sky, saying, who am I, what am I? And to see somebody of this magnitude and this presence and this power uh, say such a thing, my God, now we'll follow him till uh, forever. We'll follow him forever. What a glorious uh, teaching, what a glorious insight for us mere mortals to understand from somebody who is an authority from, from the authority, <laughs> from divinity itself, that we are everlasting life, we are the infinite, we are beyond time and space, we are without any limitation, we're beyond grief and pain and suffering, we can transcend all separation and all weakness, we are power beyond uh, comparison, beyond measurement, we always are and always will be, there is no death, there is no life, there is just infinite divinity and that's who we are. What a marvelous teaching. My God, what a marvelous teaching to reach for that teaching, to have the courage to reach for that teaching, especially when we know on one hand how little we know of it and we tremble like children. We should be empty like children, empty like children. What do we know? And we should look at the master and we should follow the master. We should follow the father. We should face the devil. We should fight to the end and finish the race. One time Swami uh, had me speak in front of him. I've spoken in front of him twice and I've cringed and wobbled and yelled and screamed inside <laughs> to do such a thing because I don't like generally to speak. And uh, the first time he asked me to do this in front of a, uh, the, uh, the young uh, students at Anantapur College. You know, the three, he has three campuses, the Antanantapur College is the ladies' college. And uh, there were a thousand people there and I was sweating. So I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can remember the four Fs, you know, follow the father, face the devil, fight to the end and finish the race. And I stumbled, but I got through it. So luckily I still remember it. But that's what we should do with Swami. If Swami has demonstrated this, and he can demonstrate it in a minute, and then the next minute he can make you completely believe he's nothing. He's a child. He doesn't know your name. He doesn't know where he is. He knows nothing. Swami is extraordinary. In a minute you're filled with love. You can't stop crying. You're deeply uh, wailing and you, are, you realize you're with divinity. And the next minute you wonder who he is. Well, who can do this to the mind? Who can do this to us? But don't worry about the mind. <laughs> Just hold on. He's done it so many times to us. Let's believe it. Hold on to him. Swami says that's the difference between a man and God. Man knows nothing, but he thinks he knows everything. He struts around like he knows everything. But he knows nothing. And God knows everything and looks like he knows nothing. So Swami plays his part marvelously. Uh, he'll come to somebody that's been with him so many years and he'll say, who are you? And uh, where are you coming from? And uh, say, is this what's happening to your mother right now? And the mother's been dead for five years. Uh, no way of understanding it. And if we play the game with him and try to listen and believe it and all of that, we go crazy. I've gone crazy many times. <laughs> and I still probably have many more times to go crazy because the mind is a monkey mind. The first five years, Swami said, every time he saw me, I had a monkey mind. And finally, my mind sort of quieted a little bit. I began to realize I knew nothing. And I just was quiet, was quiet, was quiet. And finally, he stopped calling me a monkey mind. But I know it's still a monkey mind. I still believe I'm separate from you. I still get worried if I have to talk because I think that I have to say something. And I know I don't know anything. I think that I'm different than Swami, that uh, I have to earn money. I think that these are real important things. We're caught in the world. We're caught in our social life, in our mental life, in the life of duality. It's so important to us. And we have to play those roles out. But the attitude with which we play those roles out, we have to understand correctly. Swami, we, have, we need a, a divinity to tell us how to play. It's treacherous to play life. The game of life is treacherous. It can kill us. 
Or in the, the game of life, we can transcend it. The game of life can pull us into such misery and such pain, such suffering and such wailing. All we have to do is attach ourselves to a person and we pick up all their pain. We have to go through their illnesses with them and their happinesses and their sadnesses. And then we have the children and their children. Oh, we just get luggage like crazy. And we love it. And, and it's what we should do. But there is a way of getting through it without getting too attached to it. And only divinity can teach us that. Only holding on to divinity can teach us that. Only Swami can teach us how to get through. We go through it so cocky that, oh, I know I've got this beat. I know my, my, my business and my practice is going to make it. And I'm going to, re in just another year, in just two more years, I, it's going to be great. And my family's all together. But life just has a way of dealing you with the obstacles like you cannot imagine when you most least expect it, another obstacle. And this one, you think you have an obstacle? Look at this one. <laughs> obstacle after obstacle. And then the moment when we hear that we have a spot on the lung, or we're, we're, we're passing blood, or some medical problem. Oh, we can't see. One, our eye, we lose sight in our eye. Maybe we've lost both of our eyes. Maybe our loved one has terrible illness. Then what do we do? What kind of sadness? So we're going to have to detach from something. Detach from our body. Detach from our loved one. Oh my God. What pain it is unless we practice, unless we practice. Practice makes perfect. Who can teach us how to detach so we go through all of this life with intensity and with love, and yet if somebody passes, if our, if our eyes go, if we can't move anymore, if we're stricken, yes, and we smile. What a, what a wonderful change in the game of life. What a wonderful, I'm just getting closer to Swami, to merge with Swami. And if you want me to go through this, yes, of course I'll go through it, Swami. Because what else is there in life? I mean, is it my business that's great? Is it my relationship? All of those things are relatively important. But it seems to me what's more important is to practice what Swami teaches us so we learn the detachment from it. Because it just passes. Everything passes. Everything passes. Swami, you've come and you've told us this great news and great insight that we're everything, every place, always. We're omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, all love. We can transcend all grief and pain and suffering in life itself. We have the power inside of us. Like psychiatrists uh, learn, there may be a hidden memory or a hidden trauma that uh, causes uh, some psychopathology later on. And go back and find it. Be brave enough to look inside. Open it up. Consciousness opens up and you get better. Is there something inside us where we look? And if we do the inner work and we look and we treat it a certain way, all of duality evaporates. Is it inside where we have to look? Is it in the realm of the heart? Is it in the realm of our motivation? Is it in the realm of this, the subtle stirrings of our heart? And if it's pure, if it's uh, purified from ego and selfishness, is that where it lies? Is that where we have to look inside? Is that where the, uh, the rule of uh, the game of life is? Inside. Inside. The work is inside. And if uh, we take to it with every breath, Swami says, and we learn detachment, then all of duality evaporates. Swami says that we'll, there'll be a time when all we'll see is Him. Every place we look and every place we direct ourselves, everything we do, all we see is Him. What does that mean? How do we get there? Well. I think of it, uh, and in, in um, the consistent with the theme of the program, Thought, Word, and Deed, that uh, Swami's name is very powerful. He says it's all powerful. <laughs> Om Bhagavan Sri Satyasai. 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 That should be like breathing in and out. It should be like our breath to us. Om Bhagavan Sri Satyasai. We don't understand how it works or, or why it works, but pretty soon we settle into it. We rest in it. We feel the beautiful uh, vibration of its, uh, of its sound. We even experience Swami, something of Swami in, in it. Om Bhagavan Sri Satyasai. You think we, anybody could tell another person why the simple little thing of saying Swami's name uh, can bring us the infinite? I, don't, I can't tell you from experience it'll bring us the infinite. I have just faith, and Swami tells us that it will. 
Om Bhagavan Shri Satya Sai. Om Bhagavan Shri Satya Sai. Om Bhagavan Shri. Instead, in, until it stops becoming a word, it settles deep someplace. Om Bhagavan Shri Satya Sai. Oh, something goes on inside. Om Bhagavan Shri Satya Sai. Om Bhagavan Shri Satya Sai. Every time I think that um, I get worried or I'm frightened, I just release that into Om Bhagavan Shri Satya Sai. It starts taking a vibration. It starts absorbing our pain. It starts becoming like a breath. Like physical breath. If we start offering things to this, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri, until we can't think of anything else. And we say, oh, I can't think of my practice, I can't think of my business, I can't think of my medical practice, uh, my family, because I'm filled with this sound, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, holding on, holding on, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai. Does Swami come to us through his name? Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Babai Yenama. Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai. It becomes something more than a, a word. There's something that goes on. One time I heard this story about uh, Hanuman. I don't know if I tell the story, I might cry. <laughs> I can feel it. Um, he came to a uh, party uh, given by Rama. And uh, uh, Sita said, uh, Hanuman has come, uh, Rama. You've given presents to other people. Are you going to give one to Hanuman? And so um, uh, Rama says, you give him a present. So Sita uh, took this beautiful necklace made of very large pearls and gave it to Hanuman. And so Hanuman had uh, this uh, monkey-like uh, nature. And uh, he listened to the, uh, to the necklace. Which, who of us would listen to a necklace? <laughs> and um, then he looked at the pearl and he bit on it like a monkey and listened again and then bit on it and spit it out. He did this to a number of them and uh, Sita says, what are you doing, Hanuman? And he says, I'm listening to the pearls and to see if they're chanting Rama's name. And uh, if they don't, I have no, no use for them whatsoever. And uh, Sita said, uh, foolish uh, monkey uh, mind, <laughs> monkey. Uh, do you expect inanimate objects to be chanting Rama's name? And he says, of course. And she says, will the hair on your arm be chanting Rama's name? So Hanuman plucked out the hair and put it to her ear and it was saying, Om Shri Ram, Om Shri Ram, Om Shri Ram. Rama, 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 Rama. Can uh, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai become so, can we be so absorbed in it that the hair on our body start chanting that name? Is it possible or is this just a story? Swami told this story uh, to the boys one day at Dakota Canal. Uh, Professor Sampat told me this and he told, after I'd heard the story, he, he was in the audience and he got up and he told this story. Swami had told this story and the boys, uh, the students said to Sampat, tried to uh, push him up and said, Sampat, ask Swami to materialize the necklace so we can see it. So Sampat said to Swami, uh, the boys are putting me up to the Swami, they want to see the necklace, is it possible to materialize it? And Swami said, uh, later. <laughs> so, at uh, the end, uh, the last day, I believe, of the, uh, of the time with Swami Kodakanal, and the students came up to uh, Sampat and said, remember that story? You, he, Swami said later, ask him again, ask him again. So, Sampat asked again. And uh, Swami said, okay. And he materialized the necklace, and it uh, went around to everybody to see, and Sampat said, I held it in my hands, and I saw the chunks out of the pearls where uh, Hanuman had bitten the pearls. Well, we tend to think these things are just um, myth or story. But is it story? Was, is, was Hanuman such a devotee that the hair on his arm chanted Rama's name? And can Swami's name become so absorbed in our heart that, uh, that every molecule, every cell, is chanting, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Babai Yanamaha, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai. Well, for us just to say that, oh, it's so beautiful, such a beautiful sound, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai. Really, I shouldn't be talking, I should just be saying that. Uh, and that's what we should be uh, absorbing ourselves in, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai, Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai and releasing everything, all our delusion about the importance of this dual, dual world and try to rest in him and be absorbed in him. 
we should attach to him through the name, through the thought. Thought, word, and deed. Thought. And then word, uh, it's nice when we can get together and say some words about Swami. It's lovely to share some stories about Swami and let our mind uh, settle in Swami, settle in his name, settle in the words and the stories about Swami and hear his name sung in the beautiful bhajans. What else? But to be open to it. That's why many people are close to it. They won't hear it. They won't sense it. But Swami has allowed some of us to sense his greatness and to want to open ourselves. So we breathe in and we breathe out into him and we breathe into the bhajan and we breathe, bring in, breathe into his beautiful name and we listen to the stories and we listen to a story and all of a sudden we cry. Who knows why we're crying? We listen to a story or we just see his form and, we, and all of a sudden it hits something and deep we go into Swami and we weep because he's so real. He is our father and we're with him and he's here to protect us and we recognize it and the love that comes from him is so perceptible, is so extraordinary, is so vibrating, is so emanating, is so enlightening, is so absorbing that we look at him and we're transfixed and we cry and we don't even know why we're crying I mean but it's very familiar he is so real everything transpires in silence by just looking at him and we understand something very deep so I'm going to say a few words about Swami a, a, a few little uh, experiences with Swami um, the name, very important, keeping the mind attached to Swami. Swami has once said recently that um, in this Kali Yuga, very treacherous dark time, that um, the name is very, very, very powerful. And uh, it's a very great, auspicious, and congenial time to chant the name. And Swami said, when a time is right and when it is convenient, and when it's the right time, even mud turns into gold to help you. All the elements help you. And at this time, his name is very powerful and will transcend everything. During this uh, last time I was with Swami May, uh, during the summer school, uh, he was giving a discourse each night. And one day he was up in front of the audience. They were all sitting. Every night it was in, at the uh, Ramesh hall, which is built on the grounds of the uh, Brindavan campus. Swami would uh, give a discourse. Frequently, we, he was talking about such, <laughs> such expanded uh, ideas of the nature of the mind that we were, we were less awe, awestruck and, uh, and I couldn't understand. Different aspects of the mind that Swami just started to list for us to help us understand. But luckily, I don't think that, I don't think very much anymore because uh, my mind has turned into mush when I'm around Swami. So even though it's beautiful to listen to, I just say, oh, Swami, you're wonderful. And I just start chanting his name. Uh, just chant his name. We're better off chanting his name. He uh, gave a talk and he materialized a little matchbox. Uh, he was uh, talking about how uh, important it is to keep the mind on God. Uh, and that uh, the mind is very important. It's important to know the nature of the mind. All of external reality and duality rests upon the mind. The way uh, the mind is uh, creates the entire world. So what you do with your mind uh, creates your entire world, even the fabric of the world, even the structure and the material of the world will change, it seems to me, according to what, uh, what goes on in our mind. And uh, so Swami was just illustrating some uh, technique, and he said, uh, here's a little match. He took, opened this little cute matchbox, he took out a match, and uh, he struck it. He said, when the mind, the match of the mind, uh, strikes the matchbox of God, uh, there's energy and power and light. That's what happens. When the mind rests and uh, uh, strikes onto the matchbox of, uh, of God. He said, but when you take the match and you put it into water of uh, earthly pleasure, and you try to strike, nothing happens, nothing happens. Then you have to wait and do sadhana to dry the match. Then it will become potential again to have light. It will have the potentiality to have light. But immersing ourselves in pleasure and in the earthly world will put a coating on that, the potentiality. Sadhana will dry it out. 
But when we do strike Swami, when we put our mind onto Swami, then it will light up. Will Swami be every place at all times, all places at all times, when finally our mind is purified and our impulses are purified? Will we see Swami at all, all times, all places? Uh, one time, a devotee by the name of Phil Budin, lives in New York, uh, told me this uh, story. And he said that um, he uh, was a, a very successful newspaper man, uh, sold his newspaper, and uh, then could retire. And he began thinking about spirituality. So he went to different spiritual movements and different spiritual uh, teachers. And he went to one uh, meeting once, and they said, try this exercise. Close your eyes, get into an elevator, uh, go up or down a flight of, go up a couple of floors, open the door, and your teacher will come in. So he just closed his eyes, went up a couple of floors, opened the, uh, the door open, saw the door of the elevator open, in came Swami. He said, my, that's interesting. This is a pretty interesting school here. This is because I can see him pretty clearly. Came into the elevator, and then he said, go to another floor and sit down and, and uh, talk with him, and this is your teacher. Well, so he finished the lesson, and then um, he went uh, out, and every time he closed his eyes, he saw Swami. He said, boy, that was a very powerful uh, exercise they taught me there. Because I can't shake this, uh, this image. Every time he closed his eyes, he saw Swami. Every time he blinked, he saw Swami. Powerful, powerful uh, image of Swami. He thought it was just due to this little exercise. He started telling everybody to go to this school, they, they teach a little exercise, and your teacher will be with you all the time. Nobody knew what he was talking about. And uh, every time he closed his eyes, there was Swami. And uh, one day he was walking his dog, he said in uh, Manhattan. He looked up into the sky and the entire sky filled with Swami. There was no place in the sky where Swami was not. I don't know if you've ever uh, looked up in the sky with the intention to see how vast it is. It really is quite a vast thing. It's really quite extraordinary. Here we are on earth and if you look up and you take a look at, uh, at sky, it's uh, really, uh, and you let yourself sort of uh, leave into it, uh, move into that uh, expanse, you see it's really quite an expanse. And it goes from one part of the earth to the other and it fills all of the heavens. So this was an immense experience for this man. Completely filled with Swami, every place he looked there was no place where Swami was not. This is really quite an experience. Uh, very few of us have probably had that experience. Is that what it is to see Swami all places at all times? This wasn't even all places at all times, and it was overpowering to this man. He went home and he wept. He thought he was hallucinating. He was frightened. He was shaking. He, asked his, he told his wife, I'm going to, I've got to go to India uh, to see this man. And uh, he said he went to Swami, and he came in weeping in the back row of the devotee. Swami came right out, got him, brought him into an interview, and calmed him down, said uh, that he's with him, he will be with him, he will protect him. Don't worry, this was a real spiritual experience. This is one of his aspects. Well, I don't know if we're ready for something like that to see the immensity of it, and if we will just let this roll off our back and think that it has no meaning whatsoever. But uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, will we one day really see Swami in every one, every time, every place? When the heart is pure enough, will we actually see it or will it be like a little fantasy or a little thought or will we move into a new realm of consciousness where all we'll see is Swami? One time Swami told me that this does happen to people. They will see Swami every place at all times. Are we ready for such a thing? Could we even handle it? Do we even want to see it? Can we even take the Swami that Swami is showing us let alone other realms of Swami. I don't know uh, how much, what do I have to talk to? Uh, about a quarter to? About another ten minutes or so? Okay. Um, I'll uh, then tell just a few uh, stories about Swami, about my first meeting to Swami, because this is part of my meditation uh, every morning. I try not to forget. Um, I try to remember how little I know, how the world passes, and I try to remember how important it is to stay centered on Swami, and so I remember the experiences that I've had with Swami. Uh, it's wonderful to remember the uh, experiences, because this is a, a, a quality of the mind that it forgets, and that uh, it uh, has a way of deceiving you. 
It has a way of tricking you. It has a way of pulling us into the negative. And it has a way of doubting. It has a way of forgetting. If somebody's nice to us, the next day we forget and we're not even grateful anymore. We just forget it. If Swami's nice to us and gives us everything that we have, he's given us health and happiness and family and strength, and he's given us uh, this glorious insight about the nature of our own identity and the will and interest and inspiration to follow a path. And the next day we forget him. Oh, we don't think about him. We don't care. What did he give us? <laughs> the mind is like that. Every morning I try to remember my first experiences with Swami just to immerse myself in it because it forgets. I forget so easily. And uh, when I get into it, it, it alivens again. I'll tell it to you pretty quickly. Um, nine years into psychiatry, and I'm asking, have you ever seen a miracle? And I've heard about things that didn't seem quite meaningful, and all of a sudden I heard one miracle of Swami, and I said, my goodness, really? And uh, they said, yes, why don't you go see him? And within a month or two, I was in India, and um, people would say, well, you're going because he's calling you. And I thought that was very crazy, uh, because that is not... Uh, sort of a, a Western psychiatric thought. In fact, Western psychiatry thinks that's uh, called an idea of reference and a sign of psychosis. To think that, um, that reality has a special message for you. And sometimes when I, when I think somebody does have ideas of reference, I do ask questions like, does television speak to you with a special message? And oh yes, uh, that person is saying this to me and telling me to go down to the corner and that this will happen. So uh, I, I came from a background where hearing stories like that, that Swami is the doer, that your whole life is in his hands, that he is, this time that he is allowing you to hear about him, that he's giving you the impulse and the, the, to recognize him, he's giving you the, the beauty of recognizing him, the grace to recognize him, and the impulse to go see him. I thought was so crazy that you can't believe it. And in fact, when I, I forget how crazy I thought it was when I, when I think that other Westerners can understand Swami. Uh, it may be very difficult for a Westerner, a lot of Westerners to understand Swami. Because he's so great and because our, our mind doesn't quite grasp these, uh, don't, don't, doesn't quite grasp and understand these, uh, the meaning of this. So I'm going, uh, there's still enough uh, interest I have in Swami that even though I think these stories are crazy, uh, I want to go see Swami, and uh, so I'm preparing myself. I land in Bombay, and um, I was invited to the house of a devotee out on the outskirts of Bombay, and Swami was going to be at a stadium giving darshan. Uh, why is he going to give darshan? Uh, because people uh, love to see him, and uh, when he comes, uh, they have many experiences, and it gives them great uh, spiritual, uh, it's a great spiritual event in their life just to see him, and I thought that was quite strange. And so I'm uh, in the outskirts of uh, Bombay, and the time comes, I'm going to leave this apartment. I'm on about the fourth floor of a nine-story apartment. I'm leaving it, and I'm coming out. And as I leave this apartment, Swami passes me and goes into the apartment. And um, that was amazing. Uh, because from my scientific mind, I, I didn't even recognize it was his love that was doing. I didn't recognize his love in it. I didn't recognize, uh, I just recognized that it, it was improbable that that would happen. From a scientific point of view, uh, like you're going to see somebody in your way out in a, in a, in a uh, large, you know, millions in Bombay, and um, you're going out to see him. You're just going, the very next moment you're going to be seeing him someplace, or you're getting ready to see him, and that moment he passes you. I had to keep telling myself the story to recognize that it was a significant story, that it had some meaning. <laughs> of course, if something inside me knew it did. I, I turned around and ran after him in a strange way. I had to catch myself and say, why am I running? What is this all about? And I went up, uh, he was on the ninth floor in a devotee's uh, uh, apartment, and I went in. He was behind doors. He came out. He didn't look at me. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed how Swami can ignore you. That was my first experience, but it was appropriate because uh, we hadn't met personally, and he has all these devotees, so why in the world would he say, oh, uh, just even look at me? He didn't look at me at all. Um, and he is so great uh, to ignore us. 
even the most ardent and strongest devotee wonders where he is sometimes. Are you really there, Swami? I'm suffering right now. Are you really there? Is it, am I really to see you still in this suffering? Really? Uh, and we go bananas, berserk. His capacity to fool us and to look like he's ignoring us is extraordinary. And you get faith and confidence that, that, that it's, there's really some design behind it when you see it in action, when, he's, when you've known him, you're coming because you're supposed to be doing a project, and he looks at the person to your right and to your left and behind you and in front of you. He looks at the ants around you, and, uh, <laughs> and he just doesn't look at you, and it doesn't look like he's putting it on. I don't know. You have to see that, really, to understand the great ignoring capacity of Swami, or the ability to look like he's ignoring you. <laughs> it is a, it's one of his greatest miracles. Extraordinary. And most of us, of course, believe, or many people believe God is nowhere. You know, as Swami says, God is now here, but we, we've been ignored, or we feel that he's, he is so, uh, so beyond our, our capacity to know that we just don't believe he's around. Well, Swami was like that. Anyways, there he was in that apartment, I didn't have any personal deep devotional feeling, uh, but I was struck by the scientific probability. This seems odd to me. And uh, how deeply did I understand what extraordinary love that was to treat a devotee like that? How wonderful. Then Swami left, and I ran down to the stadium, and I couldn't get in. I was about uh, 10 rows. Uh, outside one of the gates, Swami was just a speck way out in the distance. And uh, I saw all this love towards Swami. You know, there's something when devotees meet, uh, there's, a, there's a quality that happens, really. It's, uh, maybe sometimes we don't uh, experience it, but uh, many people do. I'm going to tell you later on a story about uh, the making of this uh, film, this documentary of Swami, and you're going to see this documentary. I'll tell you all the trials and tribulations. And um, uh, let's see, where was I? <laughs> I know I want to forget this probably. Um, where was I? Where was I? <laughs> We're back. Oh, there he is coming out. There he is coming out. And the love of the group. Now, this documentarist had called, had been in touch with me, and I'll tell you about him. He came to San Diego uh, to talk with me about doing a documentary on Swami. And um, he came and he stayed at one of our meetings. He thought it was very strange that people were facing a picture and singing to a picture. He thought that was very, very strange, and also that it was hard for him to get through the door because the, sh the shoes were stacked up so high. <laughs> he thought that was strange. But he said something that I, that I didn't perceive myself. He said, the love in that group is amazing. And I, can't, I couldn't see it. Is it because Swami tells us that even though we may not like each other's personality, the spiritual work is to become one. And he gives us enough courage and enough discipline and enough inspiration to overcome the pain and the suffering of the, of the clashing of the egos and the realization that we've got to get through that. Something must happen to it. We must so soften in some way. But he said, uh, the night after, he said, um, the love was extraordinary. I called my friend in France, and I said, this group is something that I, I've never seen a group like this. The love was so powerful. And the friend in France said, my God, I can feel it in the room here. I thought it was, you know, a little imagination. People can be, become hysterical, you know. But, uh, but that's uh, something about the love. I began to see that love in this stadium, and Swami I was just looking on tiptoes. You know, he makes you really stretch sometimes. I was 10 rows back. He was way out at the middle of a stadium. It was a little, like a small little speck. And I was standing on my tiptoes and reaching over people, looking at him. And I wondered why I even had the impulse to do such a thing, to strain and look. And he started to come toward me. And my heart started to go a little like this. And he started to come toward me. And he came all the way up to the gate, uh, just a few feet away from me. And he stood. Uh, with all this bhajan singing to him and all these people looking at him in this great majesty and this marvelous uh, experience of the love that people have towards Swami. And I started to become sort of captivated. Then 
I went to Brindavan, where he was going to be, and spent some time. I saw, I became convinced of the miracles. I'm going to go through it very, very quick because we're, we're just about out of time. But each one of these miracles deserves uh, to rest in it for a bit. Can you believe that Swami can materialize an object for a scientist? Can you believe that he can materialize an object? Can you believe that he could um, materialize an object that you're thinking? Uh, can you uh, believe that he knows all about you, that he rests in your heart? Can you believe that when you begin to have a feeling toward him, at a great distance he can respond to it, and you know that he's actually responding to it? Can you begin to see this miraculousness of Swami? Well, I began to, I saw the miracle and I understood that it existed. I began to hear his, his um, discourses, which I was very negative to. The importance of being a good person. For some reason, in this Kali Yuga, a psychiatrist after nine years still doesn't understand how the basis of our life rests upon values and that we must become good. Even though we've come through World War I and World War II and there is suffering beyond imagination and on television little kids are being bombed and torn to pieces and people are being fired upon and country is being destroyed and people are grotesque and they're violent with each other and we're turned into animals. Even when we see it day in and day out, why is it that when somebody has nothing else that he wants to do but to raise human beings to be nice to each other, a father who is administering to all the world and saying, be good. Why I should feel that I don't like the message. It's beyond me, beyond me, beyond me that this consciousness has descended on earth or in us, that we're in the midst of a Kali Yuga that cannot understand that it's important to be good. And that uh, we sh it shouldn't just be a thought. We should hold on to it like it's Swami's breath, like it's his feet that we should, uh, every moment, every activity we do, we should uh, look at our motivation and see if it's pure. But I thought it was like punitive parent telling a child uh, not to have fun or something. I don't know what I was thinking. But uh, Swami's lesson to be good, and it took a while to understand the preciousness of what Swami is doing and the unusualness that somebody should come to say this message to the whole world not because it's written in a book, it's because it's out of his heart. He's saying, I've come to administer to the entire world, which is my family. Be good. And why does he say be good? Not because he's reading in a book, because he's purity and he's telling it from his experience. It's uh, divinity. That's what it is, divinity. He's administering to everybody's family. I can hardly keep up with my own. Let alone if a devotee in the group has a problem with their family let alone the uh, inviting three or four people over for dinner. But Swami has each one of our families. He knows your family. I, we sit down with, I, we once sat down with him, and my child said, Swami, what should I do? And he said, don't you remember what I told you last year? We were with him one year ago, and he says, don't you remember what I told you last year? We have trouble remembering what Swami told us last year. He has the entire world as his family, and he has to remind us, what did I tell you last year? And then he tells her again in the same words. My goodness gracious, uh, why to uplift us, to give us direction, to try to tell us to be good? Then one day I was struck. I'm sitting on the ashram grounds, and I'm just thinking, my goodness, uh, the rules that uh, regulate and direct man's consciousness, the development of man's spiritual life, are more real than the laws that govern physics. I was just thinking that. And I look up and Swami is standing in front of me. He wasn't there a little while ago. He had no reason to be there. He's standing in bliss like you've seen him, like this, in bliss for half a minute. The laws, I, I try not to forget this then. <laughs> The laws that govern man's spiritual growth, the laws that govern man's conscious expansion, consciousness expansion, these laws are more real than the laws that govern the physical universe. So uh, just this last uh, time we were at the summer school, Swami said, all of the disasters of the world, the natural disasters, the flooding of the Mississippi and the hurricanes and the, uh, the fires and uh, the earthquakes, they're caused by man's motives. 
man's impulses. Do we understand the power of our mind and the power of the impulse and that the game, evidently the rule of the game of life is to purify the impulse and offer to Swami as a beautiful flower. And he'll make all kinds of obstacles and he'll test the depth of it. And he'll give us all kinds of strange experiences. He's not here. He doesn't really know. If I do this, it'll make things even worse. Every reason, and we have to struggle inside, and we have to use our intuition and our discrimination on how to, how to do this sensibly and balanced, but to offer him the best we have. Then uh, I heard, of course, marvelous stories. The stories about Swami Aaron's miracles. There's story after story that uplift. And the last miracle was that at the end of the summer school, I came at the first summer school, 1972, May 1972, the professors and the people that had spoken were in this little room, and Swami came in, and I saw leaders of the world bowing to the master. I realized that the master was here, and that these so-called professors wanted nothing more than to lay on the, f the floor, full out like that, with their lips on Swami's feet. For a young psychiatrist, you know, that's very unusual. It took me, really, about four or five trips before I wanted to kiss Swami's feet. Because for a Westerner, it's an unusual uh, impulse to want to do anything with anybody's feet, let alone kiss their feet. <laughs> it's an unusual thing. But these grown men wanted nothing more to do but to lay just out on the floor and to kiss Swami's feet, and he would give them a mango and they would cry. And I said, I know that uh, this is a world teacher. I had to pinch myself, and I said, Samuel, remember this. In fact, uh, going over... Uh, I had heard that Swami asked people, what is it that you want? And I remember saying to myself, Swami, first of all, what I would like, I didn't call him Swami, I said, Sai Baba, first of all, I'd like this to be real. If it's real, I would like not to forget it. Because I knew then, even then, how, how fickle the mind is. And I had to pitch myself then. I said, here's the world teacher. I know that he'll be known far and wide. This is just a small sign of it that the leaders are coming here and they recognize his authority and they're bowing before him. I know what's going to happen. I said, oh, Swami, let me not forget this and give me the impulse to stay attached to you. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Uh, you've been very kind to listen to me. Uh, and uh, thank you, Swami, for giving me some words to say. Uh, Swami, uh, keep me close to you. Um, let my mind know that you're the only thing to attach to. Give it, give it some kind of sense. And Swami, give us all the inspiration to focus on you uh, always and to be centered in your name. Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai. Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai. Sai Ram.